One of the most important things about crisis management is to be ready. It seems obvious, but many of us don't have a crisis management plan in place or don't have a crisis management team. In this presentation, I will walk you through the different stages of crisis management planning, and I hope it inspires you to get a crisis management team in place and be ready because crises happen all the time. I'm Paula Alvarado, Head of Global Communications for Uppsala Monitoring Center, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. Okay, let's get into crisis management by diving into a crisis situation and imagine it's Monday morning and you wake up to this. Tonight, Cipro is a common antibiotic prescribed for treating a number of bacterial infections. But CBS2 is an alert about this popular drug and why some say it may be a prescription for danger. I've wanted to be a firefighter since I was a kid. And for nine years, Chris Jones has been living that dream. But the last five months, Jones says, have been a nightmare. My life got flipped upside down. Flipped upside down, he says, because of crippling side effects he experienced after taking the popular antibiotic Cipro Floxacin, or Cipro as it's more commonly known. On a walk with my dog after taking the medicine and it felt like a bomb went off in my body. And it's pain that's continued ever since, especially in his legs. His story is so, to me, uh, typical of many of the stories that I've read about and looked through FDA files on. Dr. Charles Bennett is a professor of pharmacy who recently filed a petition asking the Food and Drug Administration to put broader warnings on Cipro. The medication is part of a class of antibiotics called quinolones, along with the drugs Levaquin and Avalox. Doctors are not aware of the full range of toxicities that are associated with the quinolones. Critics also charge the drugs, which are so strong they can kill anthrax, are too freely prescribed for illnesses that could be treated with less powerful medications. They haven't done a good enough job warning the public about how dangerous this drug is. But the FDA says it's logged just 4,500 reports of serious side effects, an exceedingly small percentage considering 23 million prescriptions are filled each year. Drug makers already list side effects, including the possibility for tendon and nerve damage on the labels. I just don't know if I'm going to get better or not, and no one can tell me. Jones is living with the pain and other side effects, which even the FDA acknowledges may be permanent in some people. The hardest thing is not knowing. Now, the FDA told CBS2 it's continuing to check complaints, and Bayer, the maker of Cipro, said in a statement that it encourages patients to speak with their health care providers regarding any symptoms that they may experience after taking a prescription product. So we have seen the news. We've seen what's happened. We've seen what we have seen what's the story. So what do you think is the first thing you should do? You will get all these calls. Your boss is calling, your colleagues are calling, everyone is a bit on a panic stake. What do we do? Well, we need to first stop and think and say, well, where were the signs for this crisis? This crisis don't happen out of the blue. There are lots of signs. In the case of the FDA, there were lots of signs that alerted them that this was happening and they were prepared for it. So they had a response, they addressed the media, they addressed the communities. And um, of course, their reputation was affected, but they really worked hard to address the situation. They saw the signs coming and they were ready for it. And that's the important thing about a crisis. We don't want a crisis to find us in this situation, in a total panic state. We need to understand first that when we talk about crisis management, the threat base is a potential damage a crisis can cause on our organizations or stakeholders or on a sector and industry, and that a crisis has three related threats public safety, financial loss, and reputation loss. And uh, a crisis will, to some extent, always damage the reputation of an organization. No organization goes totally un unhurt and damaged by a crisis, okay? So that's something we need to keep in mind. It's really important that we understand that when there is a crisis, 
when we see something in the news that really challenges our organization, like we saw just briefly a few minutes ago, um, we need to be prepared. And our first concern has always has to be public safety. What can we do to address the concerns of the public? So why, why is it different? Why do we think about crisis communications? What is it different to our regular communications? Well, during a crisis, the stakes are much higher. Time is critical. You really need to act even before the information is complete, which is a challenge, a real big challenge. The risk of adverse consequences is really high. If you don't inform the public on time, if people don't know about this problem, things can go seriously bad. You need to be flexible, you need to improvise. And at the same time, you have a, a group of people involved. So it's kind of difficult to move fast when you have to pull along so many other stakeholders, so many other players. Um, when there is a crisis and you're trying to address the concerns of the public, uh, usually the public finds it very difficult to, to understand what they're being told because you are stressed and you need to hear it several times through different kind of message, different channels. You need to package the message in different ways so it reaches all the, all, all the target audiences more than once. Um, at the same time, you have to move super fast because a crisis changes all the time and you have to deal with the stress and fatigue that are normal in a stressful situation, in a crisis situation. But can we ignore it? Can we just close your eyes, close your ears and say, this is not happening to me? No, you can't. Nowadays, you can't. With social media, internet in general, but all the networks of bloggers, it's impossible. First of all, it's not ethical. You have to address a crisis. But even if you wanted to, you can't avoid it. You have to take your head out of the sand and face it. But let's have a baseline now for this presentation. And let's agree that effective crisis management handles the threats in order. There is a process. And the primary concern is public safety. That's what we do first. A crisis ma damages an organization and its stakeholders, but the main concern should always be the stakeholders. Okay? Public safety comes first. If you don't address public safety first, then the damage from a crisis is even bigger. Then you have reputation and financial concerns that also need to be addressed, but that comes after. Now, there is a crisis, it's Monday morning, you see this in the news, what do you do? Well, if there is somebody here who has a crisis team, please, let's stop the presentation now for a second and let's listen to your experience dealing with a crisis. If nobody here has a crisis team, then let's talk about the importance of having a crisis team because this is what you need to do. When there is a crisis, the first thing you need to do is to call the crisis team. But, aha, uh -huh, what happens if I don't have a crisis team? Well, you need to be ready. The crisis management strategy is designed to protect an organization and its stakeholders. Crisis management is a process, and as a process, it needs to be planned in advance. It's not reactive. You don't react to a crisis. Well, we do all the time on a personal level and on work level, but we as organizations need to have a crisis management team that makes a crisis management a process that can be handled with care, lessening the damage to our stakeholders and lessening the damage to our organization. Now, why is so important? Why can we just think of, why is it important to think about our organization? Why don't we just focus on the public and our stakeholders? Because the most valuable asset an organization has is the trust that its stakeholders have on it. 
okay? Especially in public health. If we as national centers of regulators don't have the trust or pharma, pharma industry, if we don't have the trust of our stakeholders, then we have nothing. And that's why it's so important not to neglect the reputational damage caused by a crisis. Okay, it's really important. As I said before, our first concern should be public, the public health, and um, and um, basically making sure that that all our stakeholders, all all our audiences know what they need to know to be safe, and to make the best possible decisions during a crisis. But it's very important that we also take care of the image of our our organization. We need that image to make to get to our message across. We need to have a strong, trustworthy image to be able to really help those affected by a crisis. Okay, so don't panic. And let's discuss now how do we create a crisis management team, a crisis management plan. Well, as I said before, crisis management is a process, and as a process, it can be divided in three phases, in three stages. First, we're going to talk about the pre-crisis phase, and this is prevention. This is what you do to reduce all the known risks that could lead to a crisis. Then it's preparations, which involve creating the crisis management plan, training the crisis management team, and rehearsing, doing exercise really testing your decisions and making sure that you know how to act and what to do, okay? When there is a crisis, there are things that have to be done almost on autopilot. You know who you need to call, you know who comes first, you know who looks after what areas, and there you have to leave your, <laughs> your head free to think and to make decisions that are really, really crucial. So everything that can be put on autopilot, put it on autopilot, okay? Who calls who, who goes where, who, who has a keys, who has, all those little details have to be discussed and decided before. Then the crisis response phase, that is when actually the crisis happens and is what you do and say after the crisis hits is when you send the messages to your different publics and um, this crisis response has two stages. First is initial crisis response, and then the reputation repair, and then when you're dealing with behavior intentions that you need people to do something, you need people to act in certain ways, okay? And um, the initial crisis is really important because you need to be really quick, as accurate as you can, and as consistent as you can in a time of a lot of uncertainty especially if you haven't foreseen this crisis, if you didn't, um, if this really took you totally by surprise, you have your team ready, but you never anticipated this topic to become a crisis, then it's really, really hard. So the stronger your team and the more prepared you are, the, bet, the better. Then you have the post-crisis, when is when you just, okay, the crisis is passed, and what do we do now? Well, it's key, it's really important that you deliver all the information you promise to all the different sources, including the media. It's important that you keep everyone who is concerned updated. And it's really crucial that you analyze a response and make changes to improve things. Um, it's also the time to assess the crisis management team and take off anyone who is not really cut for it, okay? Not everyone is really capable of managing a crisis situation for a sustained period of time. And um, people get exhausted, people get totally burned, so it's important that you take care of those in the crisis management team after the crisis. Give them time to, to you know, to, to settle, to calm, to recover, hmm? or change them if they couldn't manage it. What, follow is now, what follows now in this presentation are 10 key steps to crisis management. And I'm just going to walk you through it very quickly, um, but you will have time to review them. 
The first one is to anticipate a crisis. Uh, here is where you need to do a vulnerability audit. That means to assess, to have a clear view of what are the possible risks. And then this would lead you to create a, a planned crisis response that you need to design, discuss, and approve in advance. The second one is identifying the crisis management team, a small and lean team. Okay, and the communications head is essential in this team as, as it is to have people from logistics and finance. Okay, then you need to identify the spokespeople. You can't find them during the crisis. You need to decide who they are before. And that means specialists from different areas as well. And you need to train them. Okay, you need to train them because you need to minimize the possibility of, of them being misquoted or misunderstood by the public in general. You need to establish reporting and monitoring system, okay, so you can really quickly reach all your stakeholders through different channels. You need to make those decisions in advance. You need to identify your audience, okay, who are you talking to? Who are the most important stakeholders? How do you reach them, okay? And don't forget your employees because all of your employees are representative of your organization and they all will help you disseminate the messages. And then number seven, you need to approve pre-developed messages. These are really general messages that can be complete, fill in the blanks, you know, that you need to develop and approve in advance or when the crisis is happening, especially in the first part of the response to the crisis when you have to be very quick and accurate. You have this message pre-approved. Um, all these first seven steps happen before a crisis strikes. Number eight happens after a crisis strike. And this is when you need to stop and think and look at what you have done and see what changes you need to make. How, what do you need to change in your crisis communications strategy, in your crisis management plan, and then make those changes and go ahead. Okay, this is point nine, is like once you have made that assessment, you have assessed what a crisis is, what changes you need to make, then you have to finish and tailor your key messages. Those, those pre-approved messages, this is when you complete, you fill in the blanks, and then you keep them as simple as you can, and you send them to your different audiences. After a crisis, that's point 10, it's very important to evaluate the communications plan the crisis management plan and make sure that you document the lessons learned and that you use them to improve the crisis plan for the next one, for the next crisis, okay? So these are the 10 points that please I'll ask you to review and email me if you have any questions. Um, I hope you found this, I hope you find this presentation useful and uh, um, I hope that after this you really go back to your offices and talk to your colleagues and put a crisis team together because it is essential. No one is free from a crisis in an organization. It's just a matter of time. So be ready. Thanks.